All right. Uh, looks like we're going. <coughs> Excuse me. Let's uh, double check here. Yep. Looks like we're recording. All right. This is uh, part one of the chapter three-ish um, lecture. Points in distribution. In distributions, I call it z scores and the normal distribution because those are the two big things that we're going to cover here. Uh, also known as if you don't learn this really well, you're going to fail this course. This is true because if you don't understand what we're going to talk about in this chapter and if you don't kind of get it embedded, then everything else we do in this course is going to be extremely confusing. You're just going to feel lost the whole time. This is one of the key things that you need to master is chapter three stuff. All right, so normal distributions. Um, you have some pictures here of a couple of normal distributions. Normal means a particular mathematical shape. There's a formula that goes with this. There's a family of distributions that can be described by this really specific, pretty complex formula that we're not going to look at here because uh, we don't do calculus in this class or anything like that. There's an infinite number of possible normal distributions. So you can have... You could have people's height being normally distributed. You could have number of dogs owned by people in McAllen be a normally distributed variable. Any number of normal distri distributed variables. The variables um, could have different scales. They could be like uh, a scale of number of dogs or a scale of tenths of a degree. So you could have like a difference between a big number and a little number be like five dogs versus ten, togs, ten dogs. Or you could have a difference be... 0 0.01 degrees versus 0 0.0001 degrees, so the scale can be totally different. Um, but in fact, if it's a truly normal distribution, then there are only really two dif differences between any normal distribution and any other normal distribution. Each normal distribution can have a particular mean, the middle, the, and when we draw it, it's the middle vertical line, that's the mean. And there's the mean there. And each one can have a different standard deviation. Now, this is a population thing or a theoretical thing. Sometimes it's not a population thing. Population meaning an infinite number or all possible something or others. Or it can mean a theoretical mathematical thing that doesn't exist in the real world. And that's what we really mean most of the time when we talk about a normal distribution. It's a model. And so because of that, we use a Greek letter, the Greek letter mu. This is not an M. This is not an N. This is not a U. It's a mu, M-U. It has this low kind of drop down extender here and then it's kind of like a U beyond that, like a U with a big long tail at the beginning. Uh, it's what our M came from in English and the capital looks like a big M. Uh, so the mean can be different, so you could have a, a high number mean or a low number mean and you can have a standard deviation difference between the, the distributions. Standard deviation is indicated by lowercase sigma, it's like an O with a little extender going out to the right, sometimes in cursive it's like kind of curved a little bit. Um, and sigma is lowercase s in Greek, so s for sigma, s for standard deviation. So the standard deviation, I sometimes draw it like I do here. I make a line that's one standard deviation above the mean or a standard deviation below the mean. We're going to use the standard deviation of a distribution as like a ruler to mark off steps inside the distribution, always starting from the mean. How many standard deviations are we now away from the mean? Here the standard deviation is a big step. Here the standard deviation is a small step and you know how to calculate the standard deviation, it's more or less the average difference between any one score and the mean. It's the average deviation from the mean, calculated by a very complicated means that shouldn't be so complicated, but for mathematical reasons it works out nicely. So those are the only two ways any normal distribution is different. And once you hear that, you should say, well, if we could find a way to change any normal distribution's mean and standard deviation to be like the same value, then all the normal distributions would be the same. And that's exactly what, what we do. So let's see some examples of things being different with normal distributions. So let's look at this scale. Um, the old scale of the GRE and the SAT tests, they have a new, new scale now. So let's say here's a distribution and here's another distribution. Those things have the same standard deviation and I can tell because they're the same width. Now, theoretically, this goes off to infinity in both directions. The theoretical standard, or stand the theoretical normal distribution has no end. It's negative infinity and positive infinity. But the mean has a definite point. And you can tell that these are about the same spread. You can tell because I copied and pasted this little bell curve graphic here. So here, the mean might be something like 600 or 605 or something. And up here, the mean might be something like 790. But otherwise, they're the same. 
So you could, all the numbers that make up this distribution, so maybe thousands of people's test scores, could be converted into this distribution pretty easily by just going back here and every single number adding, I don't know, what's the difference? Like, I don't know, 190 points? Like adding 190 points to each person's score here, and then you would have this distribution. But there would be no difference in variability. The spread is the same. So that's what happens with um, changing the mean of a normal distribution. You just change where it is on the number line. You don't change anything about it besides just where it is. You're just sliding it from left to right on the number line. That's what, you, that's what happens when you change the mean. The stand, when you change the standard deviation, you're not sliding things around. So here's something with a mean of 650, a distribution with a mean of 650 on the same number line. And this standard deviation might be something like, uh, I don't know, 50 points or something. Well, th here's a different standard deviation, or a different normal distribution. And this one might have a standard deviation of five points. So the difference here is with a smaller standard deviation, all the stores are squished together. Now, technically, this line still extends out forever on both sides. But there's a greater density of scores piled up in the middle. And here, there's not as many scores piled up in the middle. They're more spread out. So you could also have a very spread out normal distribution, a big standard deviation. So the standard deviation is the thing that tells you how spread out the normal distribution is, and the mean is the one that tells you where on the number line it is left to right. And if you mess with those two things, you've got all possible normal distributions. So when we're dealing with normal distributions, we count by steps within the normal distribution. We pick some place, and we almost always pick the mean to start with. And then we count by a certain number of steps. And each step has a certain number of units, whatever it is you're measuring. And so just to dem demonstrate this process, which you're already familiar with, and you're thinking, oh, this is confusing maybe, but you know how to do this. So let's say a team starts here. How many first downs maximum before they make a touchdown? They're at the 30-yard line, at their own 30. Well, a first down is 10 yards, so they have to go one to the 40, another one to the 50, another one to the, or to the, to the other team's 40, and then to the 30, 20, 10, touchdown. So we can count those. How many first downs? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Seven first downs. So there were seven first downs, seven steps of 10 yards each. This is the kind of counting we're going to be doing within distributions. We'll start from the mean and say how many steps of whatever number of points each. There we go. So let's say in the future we decide that fo football is too too easy. Those, those guys out there are just you know prancing around and it's just too easy. It's too easy to get first downs. We're getting scores in the hundreds every game. Defense is impossible. So we change it to be 15 yards for first down. Now how many first downs before a person gets, like maximum, so minimum number of first downs, maximum number of progress, maximum amount of progress. So there's one. It will take you to uh, your own 45. The next one will take you to the other team's 40. And then another one would take you to the other team's 25. Then you'd be to the team's 10. And then a partial one to score to get your touchdown. So one, two, three, four, and two-thirds. So four and two-thirds first downs between here and here in our weird future football where 15 yards is a first down. So do you see how we just changed that? It's the same as this system. We just changed the size of the steps. Here the steps are 10 yards. Here the steps are 15 yards. So now with 15-yard steps, there's only 4.67 that are needed. Now, let's say fun time football, and you're playing with your friends when you're a kid, and you decide that something like five yards is your first down, but you're playing on a big football field. So how many steps? Well, a lot. Two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen. Looks like fourteen. There we go. Fourteen steps, fourteen first downs. So do you see by changing the scale, changing the size of the steps that you have... Um, different distances, relative distances away from some anchor point. Here we were starting at the 30-yard line. What we're going to start with in general within standard within distributions is we're going to start with the mean. Here's another example of how we use this kind of relative one-step measuring. Um, let's say you get you show up at New York and you, you're 
in Manhattan, you end up getting off the train at the 50th Street Metro Station, and your friend's uh, just trying to give you directions on how to get to her house. So how many blocks is it, and in which direction? We need to know that. Is it uptown or downtown? Uptown is going to be going up 8th Avenue, and downtown is going to be going down 8th Avenue. So if you're starting at Metro, how far away is this point, 53rd Street? And in which direction? So how many blocks and up or down? Three blocks up. So you start here. One block, two blocks, three blocks. What about there? Well, that would be four blocks. What about there? Minus two. Now let's say down is minus. So two blocks south, two blocks downtown from that, from that metro station. What about here? four blocks downtown. So one block uptown. So you're getting this picture here? This is, this is just what we're going to be doing. We're going to be counting within a distribution starting at a certain point and we're going to go be going up or down from that point. And up we're going to call positive steps away and down we're going to call negative steps away from that point. So now let's look at this distribution. Let's say we asked a bunch of students I don't know how many students we can count these blocks. I did a histogram, but I put individual blocks to show you all the data here. So I don't know, it's like 30 students or something. We asked a bunch of students how many hours they spend studying every day. And let's say that the mean in this distribution is 6, the standard deviation is 2. So right here, this, the mean is 6. So everybody who has a score of 6 hours, whoever, who said I spent 6 hours studying exactly, that, that person is right at the mean. So here's the mean. And we can mark this, this thing off in standard deviation units. Down two standard deviations is four. Down two more is two. Nobody said two hours studying. Up two standard deviation is, is, or one standard deviation is eight. And up another standard deviation is 10. So I think that was unclear. Down one standard deviation is actually two hours. That's four. Down one more standard deviation. So, mar so marking by standard deviations, we can say, what's the z-score? what's the standard score or z-score for any particular student. So a student who said that she studied uh, four hours a week, or sorry, four hours a day, what's that person's z-score? Negative one, because a z-score is two hours, so two points in the distribution, two raw scores, and two scores down from six is four. Four is two scores from six, and it's in the negative direction. What about a person who studies eight hours? That's a lot of studying. That's good. 1.0, positive one, because one standard deviation is 2.0, and so one standard deviation up from the mean is eight. So anybody at eight has a z-score of 1.0, one standard deviation on the high end of the mean. This person, 1.5 because one point is going to be a half a standard deviation. If a standard deviation is two, then half of that is one. And you can do that kind of math with standard deviations like this. So one standard deviation, and then a half. This person, this is very important, zero. The z-score of the mean is always zero, because you are zero standard deviations away from the mean. That's all a z-score a z is. It's a measure of how many standard deviations from the mean you are. And if, you, and if the score you're talking about is above the mean, then it gets a positive z-score. And if it's below, it gets a negative z-score. Here's another one. Negative 1.5. So two points is one standard deviation. And so then half a standard deviation. We're only halfway to this next mark here. Halfway, we're at 1.5. 0 0.5 if you go up to just seven hours, etc. So you could just put a whole second axis there, and I would often do this in school when I was, uh, every once in a while now, when I'm doing a problem, you kind of just mark off the big steps in standard deviations, like by 0.5s or by whole numbers or something like that, just so I know where in my distribution I'm going to hit the one standard deviation mark, the two standard deviation, you know, the negative one z-score, the negative two z-score. It, it can be handy. It can be a nice little visual tool. So let's find some z-scores. I don't think you'll need any calculator or any math. But let's say that there are governors, and let's say of all the governors, all 50 governors in the U.S., the uh, mean 
IQ is 125. Now it says mu because we have all the governors. Even though it's only 50, it's a population because we have them all. So mu is 125, and the standard deviation, sigma, is 12. So Governor Johnson, whoever that is, I made these people up, has an IQ of 131, Lankin, 107, and Yalmus, 89. So let's find the standard deviations of all those people. So Governor Johnson, IQ of 131. So I'll wait a few seconds so you can pause and do this yourself, and then I'll show you a way to work it out. I don't think you'll need any calculator or anything for this. I tried to make the numbers work out nice and easily. Okay, so how many standard deviations? This is the question. How many standard deviations from the mean is Governor Johnson's score? His score is 131, so starting at the mean, how far do you have to count from 125? How, how many standard deviations do you have to count to get one to 131? Well, what's that difference? The difference between 125 and 131 is 6. So if you're getting what's going on, then you're way past this point here. This, but if you're not, then this might help you see what's going on. 6 is 1 half of 12. 12 is one step. 12 is a first down. 12 is a block, whatever you want to call it. So 6 is a half a first down. It's a half a, a, half a standard deviation. It's a half of a 12. So 125... Oops, that's a mistake. Here, I'm just going to fix this right this minute. I'm going to fix my mistakes as we go. Let's so 131 is 0 0.5 standard deviations away from 125. 131 is actually higher than 125, not lower, so it would get a positive sign. So Governor Johnson's z-score is positive 0.5. We're going to do all of these. So back to the IQs. Governor Lankin has an IQ of 107. Let me pause so you can do it yourself. Okay, how many standard deviations are there from 125 to 107? Well, the difference between those numbers is 24. And you can probably see that I worked this out. 24 is a nice multiple of 12. 24, oops, what have I done? Okay, obviously this was hasty. We're going to do do over here. So, how many standard deviations from 125 to 107? 131 mi minus 107 is 24. Okay, one more time. Ah, let's try this again. Governor Lincoln's IQ is 107. That is 18 points away from 125, which is the mean of the distribution. Maybe I'll go back and try and edit that messed up part out later. Um, let's see. Edit Lankin IQ. All right. Maybe I'll remember to do that. So 18 is one and a half standard deviations. So 18 is one and a half twelves. Twelve is one and a half. Goes into 18 one and a half times. So 107 is 1 1.5 standard deviations away from the mean, which is 125. And 107 is lower than the mean 125, so it gets a negative value. So Governor Lankin's z-score is negative 1.5. So here we go. Let's see how I did on this one. Governor Yalmus has an IQ of 89. So how many standard deviations from 125 to 89? I think the difference there is 36 points. 36 is 3 twelves. So 89 is three standard deviations away from 125. 89 is lower than that mean, so it's three standard deviations away, but it's in the direction of going down, not in the direction of going up if you start at 125. So Governor Yalmus has a z-score of negative three. So let's do another example here. Car miles per gallon. Let's say there are hundreds and hundreds of cars and the mean of all those car miles per gallon is 27, and the standard deviation is 5. Let's say you have some cars. A big masculine SUV gets 17 miles per gallon. A small pretentious hybrid gets 42 miles per gallon. An electric car gets 82. And your mom's van gets 7. Okay, maybe not your mom's. Somebody's mom. I probably don't want to be talking about your mom in my lectures. Somebody's mom. Um, so let's look at the, at the SUV getting 17 miles per gallon. How many standard deviations is it from 17 to 27? Well, the standard deviation is 5 points. The difference there is 10. From 17 to 27, it's just 10 points. So that's two standard deviations, two fives. Because remember, the standard deviation is 5. That's the size of our steps. 
So to go from 17 to 27, you have to do 5 2 times. So 17 miles per gallon is two standard deviations from 27 miles per gallon. 17 is lower than 27, which is the mean, and the mean is where we always start measuring from. So it gets a negative z-score. So the SUV z-score is negative 2.0 in this distribution. So now the small pretentious hybrid. How many standard deviations from 42 to 27? Well, 42 minus 27 is 15, so I'm sure you can see where this is going. 15 is three standard deviations. It's three fives. A standard deviation is five points. So to go 15, you have to do three of those, 5, 10, 15. So three standard deviations. So 42 mi miles per gallon is actually three standard deviations away from 27 miles per gallon. And when we say away, we mean higher. 42 is higher than 27. So the hybrid score is a positive z-score, positive 3, because it's three standard deviations up from the mean, which is 27 miles per gallon. So the superior electric, 82 miles per gallon, which is just kind of insane. So how many standard deviations from 82 to 27? Actually, we should say from 27 to 82. Yeah. The difference there is 55 miles per gallon. That's 11 standard deviations. 5 goes into 55 11 times. So you need to take 11 steps if each step is 5 points or 5 miles per gallon to get from 27 to 82. So 82 miles per gallon is 11 standard deviations away from 27 miles per gallon. And 82 is definitely higher than 27. Therefore, it's 11 standard deviations up. Therefore, it has a z-score of positive 11, which is kind of an insane, ridiculous z-score. But these things happen in real problems sometimes. You would usually not see very many z-scores in real data sets that are above maybe 3 or 4, 5, something like that. So... Mom's van, 7 miles per gallon. I say this because my mom had a van that got 7 miles per gallon on a good day. So how many standard deviations from 7 to 27? Well, the difference right there is 20 miles per gallon. 20 is 4 fives, or 4 standard deviations. So if you start counting at 27 and you, and you want to get to 7, you have to take 4 jumps if each jump is 5 points or 5 miles per gallon each jump. So 7 miles per gallon is 4 standard deviations from 27 miles per gallon. 7 is lower than the mean. Therefore, the z-score that goes with 7 is a negative z-score. Mom's van z-score is negative 4.0, which is a very low z-score. So these are ways of ranking scores relative to each other, because if you think about it, the mean comes from all the scores. Now let's do another exercise, and maybe this will demonstrate, start to demonstrate why we might find this useful. So Rhonda and Jenny are talking to each other about their college scores, and they're looking at their verbal tests. Now, this is the old school SAT verbal test. I've got to update these lectures, but I don't actually know what the distribution of the new one is yet. But the old SAT verbals, verbal test had a mean of 500 and a standard deviation of 100. And Rhonda got a 622. Jennifer got a 27 on the ACT verbal. The ACT verbal has a mean of 21 and a standard deviation of 6. These are very similar tests, so we can compare them head to head. If it was radically different things, you might wonder how meaningful it was to compare them head to head, but mathematically you can still do it. And these are pretty similar, so it makes sense. So you've got Rhonda getting a 622, Jennifer getting a 27 on totally different tests. Who did better? Who got the better score? Who has higher ver uh, verbal abilities as measured by standardized testing? So let's do Rhonda's z-score. Let's do a z-score for each of them and see which z-score is higher. So Rhonda's z-score, you can do it yourself if you want. Here's the data. So how many standard deviations are there from 500 to 622? So starting at the mean and counting to wherever Rhonda was at. Well, there's 122 points. And since the standard deviation is such a nice number, 100, then you can probably do that math in your head. Just move the decimal place. So 1.22 one hundredths. So 1.22 standard deviations. So Rhonda got a z-score that is 1.22 standard deviations above the mean. Since it's above the mean, then it's positive. So Rhonda's z-score is, is a positive 1.22. Now, we don't always put positive when it's positive. It's just like any other number. 
we leave out the positive if it's positive, but I'm doing it for demonstration purposes here. So Jennifer's z-score. You can do it yourself if you like. Okay, how many standard deviations are there from 21 to 27? Well, the standard deviation is 6. There's one standard deviation. 20, the difference between 27 and 21 is 6. 27 is just 6 points up from 21. So that's one standard deviation's distance. 6 is exactly one standard deviation away from 27, or from 21. Sorry, 27 is exactly one standard deviation away from 21. And since it is higher than 21, it gets a positive value just like uh, Rondes did. So Jennifer's z-score is positive 1.0. So comparing, which one did better? The Rhonda's z-score, the z-score for Rhonda's score was 1.22. The z-score for Jennifer was 1.00, so Rhonda did better. Rhonda got a higher score. And because this is, these variables are normally distributed, um, we could look up exactly what percentile Rhonda got and what percentile Jennifer got and see how much higher Rhonda got than Jennifer you compared to other people, what percent of people scored lower. So that's how we use this stuff and that's how it might become useful for some people. And I'm going to sign out here and we'll start the next lecture whenever you feel like it.